All right. Um, so today will be the first of uh, two talks I'll be giving on the category of sheaves of sets. And this talk I'll be giving more of a sort of a general overview of the basic theory. Um, so I'm going to start with pre-sheaves. Uh, first from the classical sense, then in terms of category theory. From there, I'll be natural to talk about the Yoneda Lemma. Uh, this will help us sort of understand the structure of uh, pre the category of pre-sheaves, how it relates to the category we start off with. Uh, from here, we'll step into sieves as just a sort of a nice convenient language for talking about uh, sub-objects in the um, category of pre-sheaves. And finally, I'll end with the characterization of uh, sheaves, of sets, um, first on topological spaces, uh, then in terms of sieves. All right. So classically, uh, a pre-sheaf uh, on a topological space is the following data. So pre sheaf is a rule assigning to each open subset uh, U of X a set F of U. Okay? And this is subset, um, subject to the constraint uh, that Uh, for u inside v, so inclusions of open sets, um, we have a function res v u are from f of v to f of u. I call it a restriction. Uh, and such that uh, uh, U is inside V, inside W, then uh, res W, V, V, U, so restricting from V to um, W to V and then from V to U is the same as restricting straight from W to U. All right, so the, the prototypical cool example of a pre sheaf on a topological space. Um, comes from geometry, so obviously, so if M is a manifold, say smooth, then assigning open sets, their functions, uh, smooth functions, this is going to be a pre sheaf So restriction is going to be the obvious restriction of uh, functions, and it's fairly easy to show that restriction of one function then to one set, then another set is the same as just restricting uh, all the way down. So motivated, motivated by this, um, this sort of example, um, so good rotation, or convention I should say, uh, we call things inside f of u sections of f over u. And we and we write um, this the shorthand res v u of s. We just write that as s restricted to u. So in terms of the function sets. So this is the notation I'll be using for the rest of the talk. Um, even in the more general sense, I'll be talking about sections, and I'll be writing restriction in that way. Okay. Uh, here? Ah, oh, these are just uh, two open sets okay. in X. Okay. Now, because we're um, all clever category theorists now, after hearing the earlier talks, we can recognize fairly fast that there's a more compact way of writing this. Uh, and we can write, actually, this definition in terms of a general category. So, fancier definition. 
Uh, let C be a category. Uh, a pre sheaf on C is just a functor uh, from C op, the opposite category, to sets, the category of sets. Uh, so it's not hard to show that this is precisely the same as uh, requiring, the, requiring these conditions. So to each um, object of C, we're going to get a set, and for every morphism between objects of C, we're going to get um, a reverse morphism of sets. Okay? And we can actually recover the definition on the topological space um, by considering the category um, OX. So they're the post-set, in fact, of open subset of X with inclusions. So then this definition will recover this classical definition in that way. So Patrick, a question on the definition of the free sheaf. Free sure. Yep. Uh, U is an open set, correct? Yes. Uh, where is that with U? I'm thinking of that law as a function. What's the term there? Yeah, U is just a set. Yes. Oh. So assigning to each U a set F of U. Yeah, so the reason that um, I suppose in this seminar that we actually care about pre-sheaves is, as Dan just said, um, a pre-sheaf gives a family of sets parameterized by the objects of C. Um, so in a sense that, well, I'll make precise as I go along, the idea is kind of that we get a, a generalized object of C, so built out of objects in C, in some sense. Um, oh, and because this is a Topos theory seminar, I'm going to give you a theorem. Uh, for any category C, small category. Thank you, Dan. Uh, the category set C op of pre sheaves, where we just take morphisms of pre sheaves to be uh, natural transformations of functors. Uh, is a top loss. So I'm not going to prove that here. Um, that would take a bit too much time, but I think it will be proven in future talks. Yeah. Okay. So now we've started with our category C that we're interested in. Okay. And uh, we've got pre sheaves on C. Uh, now these are quite general objects, so we need a way of eludicating the structure uh, of this category. Uh, so. This brings us to the territory of your NATO. So to begin, for uh, any objects um, C in C, we define uh, C. We're going to go from C to set. C up to set. Now what's that going to do? That's going to send objects D so for D uh, H C of D is simply going to be the arrows from D to C. And um, the morphisms F from D to D prime. Uh, we get a morphism H F from H C of D prime to H C of D, which is going to send morphism of D prime into C G. This is going to map to pre-composition with F. So then this defines a functor, um, and in fact a pre-sheaf on C. Okay, so for every object in C, we get a pre-sheaf. Okay, so this is the rule. 
Um, but we can go slightly further. So for uh, phi from C to C prime, uh, the final natural fa transformation um, phi d, which is going to go from a h c d to h c prime d. This now is going to send morphism d to c to post composition with phi. All right, so this, is a, this defines a natural transformation of functors. So what we get then is a rule that we can take a, an object C in our category and we can chuck it uh, into the pre-shift category. Okay, so this is a functor from C into the pre-shift category. Uh, we call this using this? Yeah. Now, so we, we have a way of embedding or injecting um, C, the category C, into pre shapes But that doesn't actually give us a lot. So for all we know at this stage, Uh, these functors could forget almost all the information about C. So at this stage, this isn't sort of such a useful idea, it's just kind of a, a cute observation. Um, this is where the Uneda lemma comes in. Yeah. Well, though, sorry. Sorry, theorem. So um, C, a category, a small category, What I'm about to say is about going to justify the name embedding. I, I should say that. So yes, I should have called this the Uneda functor. Uh, it was a bit disingenuous, but I was just getting a bit excited by this result. <laughs> uh, so for C, a small category, uh, F a pre-sheaf on C, and C some object of C, uh, the map defined by phi the F going from natural transformations of HC into F to F of C is a bijection. Yes, sorry, this map sends eta to uh, eta at C of the identity morphism at C. Okay, and this map is a, is a bijection. So from morphisms from HC into a pre-sheaf, this is just the same set as all the sections of the pre-sheaf over C. All right? So what does this say about a, our Uneda functor? Well, the direct corroll corollary is the following. The Uneda embedding or Uneda functor from C to set C op is fully faithful. All right, and we can see this quite quickly. I'll give a quick proof. So, using uh, Uneda's theorem, Uneda's lemma, um, if we take F to be HD for some D. In an object of C, this just says that 
Vector transformations from H C to H D. Our in bijection with uh, H D of C, and that's equal to Hom C D in the category C. So this means that giving a morphism from C to D is the same as giving a morphism of its image in pre-sheaves under the, the UNADA embedding. So this justifies what I mean by embedding. So this sits C not just in some wild way inside pre-sheaves, but in a really controlled way. Like it just sits it in there as a, as a subcategory, if you like. Um, so with this in mind, I'm going to call any functor isomorphic to HC for some C. a representable functor. Because this is a functor from C into sets which is represented by an object of C. Um, this won't be too important um, for the content of this talk, but it just makes it easier to say, I suppose, as I go along. All right. So. So we've definitely made some good progress. We've started with our category C. And we've figured out that we can uh, put pre-sheaves on C, just like we would on the topological space. Uh, and we've actually realized that not only are these pre-sheaves some wild, unstudiable category, but that we have a nice embedding of C into there as a subcategory. Now, the UNADA uh, embedding tells us that when we embed... When we embed uh, an object into pre-sheaves, we don't get any more uh, functions from that object to other objects, okay? So in terms of uh, thinking of the pre-sheaved category as a generalization of our original category, uh, we don't get more functions in that sense. So the next most general question to ask is, uh, Do we get more subobjects? Um, under by sending C into HC, so under the UNADA embedding. So this um, to answer this question brings me to the third part of my talk. Sims. So we've got a natural question. Uh, do we get more subobjects? Well, we need to ask ourselves then, what are the subject, uh, sub objects of HC? Uh, this isn't necessarily such an easy question in a general category, but here, it turns out things are just fine. Uh, so to answer this question, we need a lemma about the monomorphisms in pre-sheaves. Okay, so what do they look like? Uh, turns out that a morphism uh, phi from F to G in pre sheaves, so these are pre sheaves over C, is uh, monic if and only if uh, phi of C from F of C to G of C. all objects C in C. So what this says is that uh, monomorphisms in pre-sheaves are controlled by monomorphisms in C. Uh, and the, idea, the result of this is going to be that sub-objects of HC uh, are going to always be represented by a sub-functor. This is the sub-functor, uh, was this mentioned in previous talks? Well, sub-functor is a functor such that its image on every object maps into the image of the, the second functor. It's a, what one would expect it to be. Um, a quick proof of this lemma. So phi is monic if given uh, phi 1, phi 2, going from any object H into F, uh, phi F. 
Yeah, yeah. So I didn't write that, but I did, I did say that. Uh, phi after phi 1 equal to phi after phi 2 implies that phi 1 equals phi 2. Okay? Uh, so this is the definition of a monomorphism. Uh, now, this is going to happen um, uh, if and only if uh, for any C, uh, phi of C after phi 1 of C be equal to phi of C times phi 2 of C implies that phi 1 of C equals phi 2 of C. And this means that, it, that uh, phi of C is a monomorphism. Okay, so a monomorphism um, in pre-sheaves is uh, monic if and only if it's monic on every object in C. All right, so then we get to add to this question here. As I said before, uh, well, actually, what's clear from what you wrote is that if phi of C is monic in a set that is injective for all C, just for one C, right? You've got to then take some maps of sets and show that if you have this condition on functions, then you have to be able to lift any function to a morphism of pre mm -hmm. So there's a, little, there's a little thought that needs to go into the converse. Thing. Right. Okay. Right. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so we did a little, little exercise to finish this proof. Uh, so we can answer our question over here. A subobject of HC is always represented by F, by a subfunctor F of HC. So, so I say this to be precise because a subobject is an isomorphism class of monomorphisms into HC. And what this tells us is that any monomorphism is given by, uh, you can always, there's always a subfunctor. So yeah, the precise statement is we can think of subobjects as subfunctors. All right, so we can pack up and go home now because, you know, we've answered that question. But we haven't really actually said that much because we, then we need to ask the question, well, what's a subfunctor of HC? So, okay, new question. What is a subfunctor? What does it look like in this case? We know how to define it, but like, what are these going to look like? These could be some sort of awful general objects. Well, this is where the notion of sieves uh, come into play. So I'll take a slight digression to give you a definition. Um, uh, so given an object C in the category C, a sieve on C is a set of morphisms. S um, into C satisfying the property that um, if F is in S and F compared with H is defined, then F composed with H is in S. So for those of you familiar with ring theory, uh, this is sort of the uh, uh, morphism analog of a right functor. And that's a cute observation. Okay, so a sieve is just a uh, right, uh, a subset of morph, uh, 
Yeah, like xenomorphisms into C are closed under precomposition. So if you think of it like, uh, sort of diagrammatically of morphisms, there's an object C here, and there's a subset of morphisms that we're into C, such that for any other set of morphisms back here, this composition is into C. So it's really sort of um, closed in this direction. All right, so what does this have to do with subfunctions in this question? Well, surprisingly, there's actually a bijection. Uh, Oh, uh, it's, uh, so it's not particularly important to this talk, but uh, this is analogous. So the, the, the idea of a set of morphisms being closed under precomposition is just analogous to a right ideal of a ring. Oh, okay, sure. It's just sort of an acute thing. Yeah. As far as I know, I don't think it's that important to this. Um, so there is actually a bijection of... Sub from subfunctions of HC to series on C. This is actually surprising on the onset, it was to me, because these subfunctions initially could be some awful functions that live in this pre-sheaf category. The sieves are about as concrete as you can get, aside from just being a morphism set. Right, so I'll give you this bijection. So first, uh, we'll take a sieve S on C, and we can define F, uh, D as just an object. We define uh, F of D to simply be uh, those f from d to c, such that f is in s. Right? So this is a subset of all the morphisms from d into s. So this is certainly going to be inside h c of d. And this holds, this inclusion holds for all uh, objects d. So this is a subfunctor. Right? So that's one direction of this bijection. And then conversely, Um, if you were to sum up to F of HC, you find S or R, R to be, let me just double check. So there, R is those uh, morphisms such that there exists uh, D in C, an object D, with F, F inside F of D. Uh, it's an easy exercise to show that this is a sieve and that these two constructions are reciprocal. All right, so as far as we care, we can go backwards and forwards from sieves on an object of C to subfunctors of HC. Okay, so this is really good. Um, like this gives us a way more concrete way of thinking, of answering this question. So, to just for completeness. Some functors of a representable functor, HC, um, are just going to be one-to-one -one correspondence with sieves on C. So, I'll give you an illustration of why we care about this idea.
Actually, before I, before I proceed, I should probably make a comment answering the question I just raised. So what do we get more sub-objects passing from C to pre-sheets? And the answer is yes. So a sub-object of C is just going to be an equivalence class of morphisms, uh, monic monomorphisms into C, whereas a sub-object of HC is going to be a sieve on C. And there's certainly more things in the sieve than just monomorphisms into C. So we actually get, uh, despite when passing to pre-sheets, we don't get more morphisms, we do get more sub-objects. So this is kind of a cool idea. <coughs> All right, so I'll give you an example of a sieve in sort of a safe topological world. So if C is just now our friend, the post-set of subsets, our open subsets of X, X is a topological space, uh, and uh, U, some open subset of X, so U is an object of this category. Uh, a sieve on U is same as the data of a family of open subsets of U. All right, so why is this true? Well, so a sieve on U is just going to be a family of morphisms uh, into U that is right closed. Well, certainly the morphisms in this category are just uh, inclusions of uh, open sets. So the family of morphisms is really, can be identified with the family of inclusions. So then the family of open sets uh, in U. Um, but we just remember that because the sieve is right closed, we don't just remember the open sets, we remember all of their subsets. Uh, this will become relevant uh, later in the talk. Um, it's just a, a point to keep in mind. Okay, so the upshot of this, which is quite exciting, uh, the slogan really, is that sieves uh, generalize uh, open covers to arbitrary objects of a category. All right? Uh, make that slogan more precise. I do need to introduce an auxiliary definition. I apologize. Uh, so we call the sieve a covering sieve. Sieve on U, covering sieve. So we're, we're still in, in this category over here. We call it a covering sieve uh, if the union of all F of So the union of all the open subsets, uh, the domains of all these morphisms mapping into C, if the union over all of those covers, uh, into U, sorry, covers U. So this, this is um, precisely an open cover, just sort of categorified. Uh, with, the, that, with that example, yeah? is there any condition? Is it just a collection of open sets, or is it like some additional more unique subsets? Just a collection of open subsets. So a sieve in this category is really general. Well, this is why we, we introduce this is a specialization of a covering sieve. So a covering sieve... It's, it's a closed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. I suppose, I suppose as in topology, one would, given an open cover, you kind of implicitly carry with you all the open subsets of elements of the open cover. Uh, but yeah, so th this makes this more, more formal, I suppose. Um, so this makes my slogan make sense now. So sieves, or covering sieves, uh, give us generalization um, of the notion of an open cover of, uh, of topological space to uh, what we would you know, hope to call an open cover of an object of a category. All right. Um, 
So why am I actually talking about this stuff? Why am I talking about open covers of objects of a category? Um, and this sounds sort of dumb. Well, the idea is, so at the start of this talk, I mentioned that uh, pre-sheaves, um, so pre-sheaves, we want to think of them as collections of sets parameterized by objects of C. Now, Uneda tells us that a pre-sheaf can be thought of as a generalized object of C, because we, we C sits in there as a subcategory. So um, pre-sheaves, we kind of philosophically want to think of them as almost objects of C. Um, now, in geometry, we would really like to kind of think about uh, generalized objects locally looking like C. So by this, I mean, for instance, uh, manifolds. You can consider the category of manifolds as being um, sort of an extension of the category of Cartesian spaces in the sense that every manifold locally looks like a Cartesian space. So it looks like an open subset of um, Rn for some n. So we kind of want to extend this idea but to categories. So we want, we want to specialise uh, pre-sheaves to those which remember local data. So I'll write this down. Good question. Yep. Covering sieve? Yeah, that means that all members of the sieve though. Ah, yes. Sorry, Sam. So the idea is to uh, As I said, the idea is to specialise pre-sheaves uh, to those that, in some sense, know about local data in the category. I've got um, quotation marks around these because I haven't made precise what exactly I mean by knowing or about local data. But this is sort of what we want, geometrically speaking. Now, it turns out we have a good candidate of this um, if we go back to the world of topological spaces. So we motivated pre-sheaves on categories by thinking of uh, pre-sheaves on topological spaces and realising that this definition could be generalised to an arbitrary category. So then it makes sense to step back and think about the version of this idea on topological spaces and see if we can extend that to a category. So, definition. So let X be a topological space. Uh, and F a pre sheaf. On X. Uh, now, we want F to, in this case, know about local data. This makes sense. Um, strictly speaking, on a topological space. So local data means data um, available from an open cover. So we want F to be compatible with the open cover in some way. So we say say F is a sheaf if it satisfies the following axiom. So one, after any open cover of an open subset of X, uh, and for any uh, sections S and T of F over U, we have the property that if S restricted to UI equals T restricted to UI for all I, then S equals T. So this means that 
the sections of the sheath are sensitive to uh, the, their values on the open cover. So they sort of know in some sense. But we require a little bit more. So I spoke about not just uh, knowing about the open cover, but being able to be uh, built from the open cover or sort of locally modelled on an object. So for this, uh, we also require that uh, view, again, um, if we have uh, sections S, I in F of U, I, uh, which are compatible with, the, with uh, the cover. So by this I mean that uh, S, I now restricted to U, I intersect U, J, so this is a subset of U, I. Uh, is equal to sj, restricted to u i intersect u j. So if this, um, if we have this property, uh, then uh, there exists some section of f over u such that s restricted to u i equals s i for all i. So this is precisely what I mean uh, by gluing. So we can take sections defined over each of the UI covering U, and as long as they agree on, on overlaps of those UI, so as long as they are compatible with the cover, then they can be glued to get one section on U. And then what this axiom then does, interacting with that one, this tells us that when we glue, um, our gluing is unique. So we're not going to have some way of gluing sections together to get one section, and then if we sort of did it in another way, we'd get another section. Uh, so this is precisely what I mean by a uh, pre-sheaf knowing about local data. So what's a friendly example of a sheaf? Uh, well, if we actually look back at our old example, so M, a manifold, Then uh, f of u being the functions u to r, which are smooth. This is in fact going to be a sheaf. So certainly checking uh, the first axiom, one. Uh, if you have a cover of u, then an f is in here, then f restricted to u i being equal to g restricted to u i for all i definitely implies that f is equal to g. This is basic so function theory. Uh, and second, and second, uh, if we have functions fi on f of ui, then for any x uh, in u, x must be in some ui, because ui covers u. So then we just define global uh, function f of x to be equal to f i of x for the appropriate i. So this is well defined because, uh, so taking f i with agree on overlaps, I should say. This is well defined because if x is also uh, inside uj, then because uh, restrictions uh, agree on overlaps, uh, this won't make any difference. So it doesn't matter which index of ui uh, x is inside. Right? So this is sort of a prototypical example of a, of a sheaf. Okay. Uh, any questions about that before we move on? No? Okay. Now, as I mentioned um, at the start of talking about sheaves, we really want um, a way of extending this idea uh, to categories, not just topological spaces. Yeah. Now on the onset, this isn't actually such an easy idea. Because on categories, on the face of it, we don't have a notion of open covers, and we don't really need to know what local means, any of that stuff. 
Uh, so to proceed, uh, so need a, a little a technical lemma. This lemma is going to allow us to categorize leaf sheaf conditions, uh, one and two. Uh, instead of just being in terms of gluing um, sections, we're going to be able to talk about uh, the, the post set of open subsets of X. It's going to be sort of a property that lives in a category. So, our pre sheaf F is a sheaf uh, if and only if uh, for any cover. of u inside x, and the following diagram is an equalizer. So we have f evaluated with u, we have a natural map Say a section to family of restrictions for all i. Okay, so this is quite a natural map. And these two maps are going to be the two different ways of restricting to the overlap. So V, V, Q. So P, family of sections, is going to be the family. to UI ZQJ, and Q is going to be uh, the other restriction. Um, Dan, do I have time to prove this properly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, this is an equalizer. Oh, yes. Uh, diagram. So why, why is this true? Okay, so first, um, let's think about so the set E, we will think about I as all those families such that uh, Consider this set. This is going to be all those families that, um, on which these two maps are equal. Okay. Then the second sheaf condition tells us that given one of those families, we can lift it to a section uh, over here. So there is a map then from sorry, there is a bijection then the quality of that between uh, F of U. Right, so we can lift any, any section, any family of sections, which are uh, agreed overlaps. The second sheaf condition tells us that we can just get an object of, um, of F of U. Uh, so this is going to give the uh, exactness, if you like, in the middle of this equalizer diagram. Yes, yeah. OK. Um, now, to get the universality of this equalizer, um, we just we, okay, take an, a set S, uh, mapping into this middle object here. Uh, and suppose that the image of S agrees with uh, these two. So, function F, and suppose that uh, P after F equal to Q after F. Okay, so what's that going to mean? This means that the families in the image of S are going to be those families uh, in E, so which agree on overlaps. But then the gluing condition tells us that those families can always be pulled back to a, a global section. Okay, and the first condition, in fact, tells us that uh, that pullback, that lifting can be done uniquely. So this gives us our universality 
and shows that this is an equalizer. Okay? Now, for the converse, uh, if this is an equalizer, uh, this is a more straightforward. So if everything which, every family of sections which agrees on overlaps, so such that these two maps are equal, uh, if this is an equalizer, then you can always lift that to a section here. So that gives us the second axiom. And then the universal property of the equalizer, universality, uh, gives us this uniqueness. So this gives a characterization of sheaves. Uh, instead of just talking about sections and gluing, we can actually talk about sort of limits, the sort of property of some, some things in a category. And does anyone have any questions about this proof? So give everyone just a moment to think about it. Will? No? Okay, all good, cool. So we've sort of made our sort of halfway step. So we wanted a categorical notion of uh, a sheaf condition, this sort of idea of gluing, uh, of a pre-sheaf knowing about local data. And some authors will actually stop uh, with this idea. So in a suitable sense, one can talk about uh, sort of, uh, sufficiently nice families of subobjects in a category. And, and as long as the category has fiber products, you could actually kind of define sheaves in this way. Uh, this isn't particularly satisfactory for our needs a, because we want to talk about the pre sheaf category. So this is, this is still a condition which is sort of not intrinsic to the pre sheaf category. And B, we're not always going to have fiber products. So we're going to need a definition of sheaves uh, in terms of sims. So in terms of things living inside the pre sheaf category. This is what uh, my final theorem will give us. Uh, this is proposition 2.2 in mclean Mordike as well. And I'm following the proof from there sort of exactly. So uh, if if x is a topological space, uh, u in x open, and f is a pre sheaf on X, then F is a sheaf if and only if uh, for uh, so if and only if for each covering sieve. S on U, uh, the the monomorphism I S going from S to H U is arising because sieves are precisely subfunctors of representable functors. So this monomorphism. And induces an isomorphism here. Yeah, yeah. And induces an isomorphism from uh, the A pre-sheaf is a sheaf if and only if for every covering sieve of every open subset, uh, the inclusion of the covering sieve into the representable functor 
defined by that uh, open subset, so that pre-sheaf, induces an isomorphism of natural transformations between the ones from HU and F to the ones from CIV to F. This now considering CIV definitely as a sub -pointer. So before I prove this, we'll just pause to think about what this means. So natural transformations by UNADO, this is going to be just F of U. Uh, and this side of things is F um, in a certain sense, uh, so the collection of all the data of F evaluated on elements of the sieve. So what this says is that uh, the, sort of, heuristically speaking at least, F then, uh, its sections on U can be built from its sections on elements of the sieve. So it respects the sieve, it knows about the sieve, uh, and this is precisely what we wanted to, uh, by local data and knowing about it. Okay. So uh, finishing this proof will occupy the like, next about five to 10 minutes. Um, I'll try to take it slowly because it's a really fun proof. Here we go. So, uh, so we, so if F is a pre-sheaf, uh, we still have, we can still make this equalizer diagram, except this won't necessarily be F, right? So we can still make an equalizer, but with E instead of F over here. So this is what we'll do. So we take E, So we consider this uh, equalizer diagram where we have identified S with some open cover of UI for this step. Okay? So here E is as above. So E is going to be um, those families of sections agreeing on overlaps. Right. Now, because the sieve doesn't just have the open subsets, it also has all of the uh, subsets of those open subsets, so it's right closed. Uh, we can actually replace each of those UI in E by um, a family of open subsets inside them. So what we'll write then is, let me just check my notation. Oh, yes. Thank you. So we replace then uh, with all open subsets V inside the Y. So we can do this because V, each of these V is contained in the data of the sieve. And now we just write uh, XV is going to be XI in F of UI restricted to V. Okay? Now, because, because these XI in E, because they agree on overlaps, this XV is actually going to be independent of the index I that, uh, that V is in. So V could be in UI and it could be inside UJ. So the reason we don't include i in this notation on the left is because it's independent of the index. Uh, so now we can actually rewrite e uh, as follows. e is then those families x, v, so v in s, such that x, v restricted to v, i is x, v, i, v, i inside v. So it's pretty easy to convince yourself that this is exactly the same condition as the on overlaps. Right. Next, using our bijection between pre um, between sieves and subfunctions. Um, sorry. Yeah. V prime. It's just a notational mistake. Now, identify 
ה-S, תוסיף. ואת הפונקציה, עושה לי גם אם אתם בא S ו-V equals to 1, if V is in S and 0 else. So by V, V in S, I mean um, V is the domain of some morphism in S. I'm using that abuse. Okay. Then Using um, this characterization of S as a functor, rather than being any sort of a collection of arrows or a collection of subsets, we can rewrite E again. We can consider so using this, consider v, uh, so XV as a map from SV to F of X. So this is going to descend where, uh, so it's going to send one, two, x, v. Then we can identify uh, E then. So the, a map from S, V, x, V being a map from S, V to F, V, then means that E, all these V, the degree on restriction, is just going to be the set of natural transformations. So then, yeah, considering sections uh, that live in E as uh, morphisms from S of V to F of V, we can then identify E with a set of all nat natural transformations from S to F. So then we can rewrite our diagram up here, our equalizer diagram, uh, as follows. So we have now a nat S to F that's going... Right, now E is going to send, uh, so E of some natural transformation, this is going to be uh, that tra natural transformation uh, for the family of all evaluations of that natural transformation at UI of one. This is definitely going to land us in uh, F of UI for each of those. Now, because we have the inclusion uh, IS from S into H of U, then homing into F gives us morphism in this direction. Yeah, so what we've done from the start, we've identified uh, for the purpose of writing this diagram at least, S with uh, these UI, with the cover, but we've not forgotten about all the subsets. So implicitly in here, we're, we're not really, uh, so we're starting with the sieve, we're not starting with the cover. And we're just taking a cover out of it, sort of arbitrarily, because there's a number of different ways to take a cover out of there. And we're just sort of holding on to all the, uh, the right closed data, so all the subsets of each member of the cover. But we're not really bringing them back into the picture until this. And then we're, yeah, then we're playing off. Uh, so we have this map um, IS, so induced by um, this functor, uh, back in this direction. And we also have the Unada functor, Unada embedding, which is going from uh, natural transformations from HU to F to F of U. And we can define a map this way that just sends a section S. S So the crux of this proof then is the following claim. Uh, that the square here, K 
commutes. Okay, so how do we see that this is true? Well, let's start down here. Uh, I'll write it down here. So we start down here with the natural transformation, and I'll go up. So I'll go clockwise first. So we start with eta. Eta is going to go up to uh, I s star of eta, which is just going to be eta precomposed with I s up here. And then applying E prime, uh, that's going to map to the family uh, eta composed with I s uh, ui evaluated at 1, i in i. Now this is equal to uh, eta of ui goes with i s of ui of 1 for each i, which because i s of ui of 1 is 1, this is going to be eta of ui of 1. So it's going to map to this family of sections in here. Now proceeding in the other direction then, so going counterclockwise, we're going to send eta to its image under the unator embedding. So that's eta at u of 1, uh, where 1 is now the identity morphism, just the inclusion of u into itself. And then along d, though out here, we're going to go to the family. Uh, eta ui one. Well, so this diagram commutes. What this means then is that f of u is always going to factor through this morphism d is always going to factor through the equalizer. Uh, but so if, uh, so then f of u, if this is an isomorphism, then f of u is certainly going to be isomorphic to the equalizer, and it will be the equalizer itself. So applying our previous lemma, that makes f into a sheaf. Then conversely, if f is a sheaf, it's going to be isomorphic to this. And so the composition of the unator isomorphism forces this to be an isomorphism. Right, so that completes our proof. So just to recap this theorem, what this has given us is a way to, we've taken a pre-sheaf, so we're still in topological world, but we've taken a pre-sheaf now, just in the pre-sheaf category, and we can tell you whether it's a sheaf based purely on uh, testing it against other pre-sheaves, so in particular against sub-objects of representable pre-sheaves. So this is a purely sort of in the pre-sheaf category version of the sheaf condition. And this will allow us uh, in my next talk, to talk about sheaves, not just on topological spaces, but on arbitrary uh, categories. And so that, that'll be what I'll talk about next week. Thanks. Thank